Monday will mark one year since the Taliban regained control of Afghanistan as the U.S. withdrew troops nearly two decades after the 2001 U.S. invasion. Afghanistan today is facing what the United Nations says is the world's largest humanitarian disaster, with more than half the country's residents facing starvation. Meanwhile, the Taliban continues to crack down on human rights and has barred girls from attending high school for the past year. The Taliban is also facing accusations of harboring leaders of al-Qaeda. Last week, the United States announced it had killed al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri in a drone strike in downtown Kabul. This all comes as Afghanistan is facing a dire economic crisis, in part because the Biden administration sees $7 billion of Afghanistan foreign reserves held in U.S. banks. We're joined now by the award-winning reporter Matthew Akins, who's reported on Afghanistan since 2008. He was in Kabul last year when the city fell to the Taliban, and he returned to Afghanistan in May to report on current conditions. He's just written a piece for The New York Times magazine titled, The Taliban's Dangerous Collision Course with the West. Earlier this year, Matt Akins published his first book, The Naked Don't Fear the Water, An Underground Journey with Afghan Refugees. Matt Akins, welcome back to Democracy Now! Why don't you lay out your findings as we mark this first year of Afghanistan's fall to the Taliban? Well, hi, Amy. Thanks for having me, as always. I went back in order to understand what had happened during the Taliban's first year in power. And as you recall, the girls' school issue was really a litmus test for whether they had changed, whether they would govern differently this time than they did during their first government in the 90s, where they didn't allow women to be educated. And they did allow girls to go back to elementary schools, to universities, but they hadn't opened the girls' public high schools yet. They had promised to do so. Um, they said it was just temporary. and. This was going to happen on March 23rd, which is the first day of class for Afghan schools. And the girls went to school. They were filmed going to class because this was supposed to be a hopeful day. And then word came out that day that, no, the schools wouldn't open. The girls were sent home crying. It was uh, an embarrassing debacle for the government. And I remember at the time not just being, not only being very disappointed and heartbroken, but, but baffled. Why would the Taliban? change their mind at the last minute like this. So that's what I went back to find out. And in my interviews and meetings with Taliban officials in Kabul, including at the education ministry, what I actually discovered was that many of them had been in favor of reopening the girls' schools. They saw it, you know, as something that was very much in their interest, um, not, not least because the international community was, you know, spending billions of dollars to avert humanitarian disaster in Afghanistan. So they had prepared a plan to reopen the schools, but la at the last minute, word came from Kandahar uh, that the schools would not reopen, because it turned out that it wasn't really up to the officials in Kabul. The true power in the movement lies in Kandahar with the Supreme Leader and the Leadership Council. So who really controls um, what's happening in Afghanistan within the Taliban? Well, you know, it's really interesting how mysterious and opaque some of this decision-making is. Even some of the senior Taliban officials that I spoke to, you know, admitted to me in private that they weren't fully sure how these decisions were being made or what exactly the role of the supreme leader, Sheikh Haibatullah, was. But in essence, the, to understand how power works in the Taliban, you have to look back at the first government in the 90s, when you had sort of two governments. You had the formal cabinet in Kabul, and then you had another government led by the then the Supreme Leader, Mullah Omar, who never left Kandahar, who stayed in Kandahar and governed with a close council or shura of other senior Taliban leaders, a kind of shadow government. Now, that became the leadership of the insurgency for the last 20 years, when they went underground in Pakistan became known as the Quetta Shura. And then, after the Taliban suddenly seized power last summer, which is something that surprised even them, um, that government became grafted onto the current Kabul administration. So you have the supreme leader in Kandahar. You have a small group around him that operates based on consensus. And some of the hardliners in that group who were opposed to reopening girls' schools essentially were able to block 
what much of the officials in, in Kabul, uh, including some of the deputies like Siraj Haqqani, uh, Mullah uh, Yaqub, the defense minister, they were in favor of reopening girls' schools, but the hardliners, in essence, blocked it. Talk about Afghanistan overall, Kabul and the more rural areas, and what this divide looks like, how it's playing out, and then we'll get into this humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, uh, perhaps the worst in the world, as so much of the country faces hunger. So. The Taliban, again, in their first government in the 90s, they were really trying to bring back this idea of the virtuous village lifestyle. This is a time of chaos and corruption in the Civil War. And in these rural villages, which are very conservative, particularly in the south, in Pashtun areas, women don't really leave the house. It's a very strictly gender-segregated society. And this is the model that they tried to impose across Afghan society as a whole in the 90s with a lot of repression and brutality. And today, there's a battle playing out within the movement over whether that vision still holds. And the fact of the matter is that even if the Taliban haven't changed, Afghan society has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. You know, millions of girls have gone to school and been educated. Their families have seen the benefits of that education. And some of the more pragmatic Taliban that I spoke to in Kabul, they really understand that that reality has changed, and they are trying to adapt as well. They have their own strict Islamist vision, but they see that girls can go to school, they can go to the office, as long as they're veiled, as long as they're separated from men. So that is essentially the tension between, you could say, the city and the countryside that's playing out within the Taliban movement itself. And unfortunately for now, we see the hardliners have won. But it is important to remember that there's, there is, uh, you know, these internal dynamics within the movement that hopefully could lead to more reform in the future. According to the United Nations, nearly 1.1 million Afghan children under the age of five are expected to experience severe malnutrition this year. This is Melanie Galvin, the chief of nutrition at UNICEF, speaking in Kabul. I think we need, in the longer term, we're still going to need a great deal of funding to just treat these children. In 2023, I will have a problem, I will have a gap in, in supply, for example, if there isn't um, additional resources that come into the country. So we've done everything we can with the donations we've had, and we're so grateful for them. Um, but this need will continue. It's not going to stop. So according to the UN, half the population faces hunger. Talk about the resources the Taliban have access to. Uh, for example, the U.S. freezing billions of dollars of Afghan money and what that means, how that plays out in Afghanistan. Sure. Well, I think it's important to understand that even though the U.S. and its allies spent more than $100 billion on development aid in Afghanistan over the last 20 years, it remained one of the poorest and most aid-dependent countries in the world. And that was in part due to all the corruption that flourished with this uncontrolled spending, much of it by contractors. And so when that aid was suddenly cut off after the Taliban seized power last August, it had the predictable consequence of causing an economic collapse, government salaries are going unpaid, teachers medical workers. So the country is now facing a dire economic crisis. Um, it's being kept on humanitarian life support by a massive humanitarian surge. There's now more aid workers working for these agencies in Afghanistan today than there was before uh, the collapse of the government last August, the withdrawal of U.S. forces. And that means that the U.S. and its allies are actually funding and, and, and these humanitarian efforts are cooperating with the Taliban. But of course, the U.S. did also seize the Afghan bank assets that were held uh, in the U.S., $7 billion, and they've earmarked half of that for victims of 9-11 and their families. Now, that puts the U.S. in a funny position, because it, it is at once both uh, the largest funder of humanitarian efforts in Afghanistan and one of the main causes of the humanitarian crisis with these sanctions. So what is the U.S. doing with that money? Right now, it's on ice, and there is talk about um, returning the other three and a half billion dollars to the Afghan, you know, to Afghans. Now they haven't; they're not going to give it to the Taliban, but they're in negotiations right now to set up maybe some sort of trust fund or something like that. 
that could be used to recapitalize the financial sector. But one of the big problems facing Afghanistan today is that its economy is paralyzed by these sanctions um, and a lot of other knock-on effects you know, other banks don't want to do business with Afghan banks because of some very genuine concerns, for example, over terrorism and money laundering. But what that means, in essence, is that the Afghan economy isn't able to stand on its own feet. Uh, it's dependent right now on external aid. The UN is actually flying in pallets of $100 bills more than a billion dollars to date that they're flying into Kabul, and that's essentially keeping the economy on life support. But you know, one of the interesting things that I realized after this last year since the collapse of the Republic is that, in a sense, for the U.S. and its allies, the crisis in Afghanistan has been contained somewhat. You know, it's been contained through this massive humanitarian surge through these agencies that are cleaning up after political messes, not just in Afghanistan, but in places like Somalia uh, or Yemen. It's, it's feeding Afghans hand to mouth. The migration flows of you know, refugees to Europe have been contained by all the border walls that have helped cage Afghans inside this, their country. So even despite the f massive suffering in Afghanistan, I think that there's a sense it's been contained. And it, in, a, in, a, in a strange way, the Taliban have played a stabilizing role in that. And I think there's been an actual a normalization of the relationships with a lot of countries in the region who see the Taliban as possibly just keeping a lid on things in Afghanistan. Talk about the U.S. drone killing of Zohari. Were you surprised by this, the uh, killing of the al-Qaeda leader, um, and the uh, fact that he was in a house owned by Khatani and what that means? Yeah, I mean, I, I used to go jogging, basically, right by that street when I, every morning when I was in Kabul, the mornings I got up early enough anyways. And it's, so it's right in the middle of the city, and it was surprising to see the drone strike there in the house that used to be rented by um, U.S. aid contractors, actually, and in an area that was occupied by warlords after 2001. But this really does show the limits of that, that, that containment strategy that I just spoke about. And the fact of the matter is that if, the, if Afghanistan again becomes a threat to its neighbors, as it did in the 90s because of groups like al-Qaeda, then you could see a, you know, intervention. Uh, on the side of the armed resistance to the Taliban that could spark a new cycle of the civil war. Um, but at the same time, I do think that it's important to remember that these groups have a long-standing relation with the Taliban. Uh, they got closer, actually, when they jointly resisted the U.S. occupation of the last 20 years. And so the Taliban kind of are in kind of a tricky place where they, they can't reject these groups, um, but they, they can't send them elsewhere, obviously. So it's possible that by keeping al-Zawahri in Kabul, it was a way of keeping him um, under supervision, but we really don't know the details. I was told by a senior U.S. official that, according to their information, much of the Taliban leadership was actually unaware that al-Zawahri was in Kabul and that it was the work of a faction connected to Haqqani, the interior ministry, um, in sheltering him. Again, um, uh, al-Haqqani is the, is the interior minister. That's right, yeah. Sirajuddin Haqqani, who is, you know, long been held to be uh, one of the fiercest opponents of the U.S., was responsible for many attacks, is designated as a, as a terrorist by the FBI, has a bounty on his head, and also happens to be one of the most socially, quote-unquote, progressive of the Taliban. Uh, he and the group around him, who, who occupy many ministries in Kabul, uh, have been some of the most vocal proponents of letting the girls go back to school, have helped out a lot of aid agencies, and they've had trouble with other elements of the Taliban over their female workers. So it just shows the, the very difficult contradictions at play in the country, and I think the need for understanding better the dynamics there. Um, finally, you spend a good amount of time in your piece uh, highlighting maternal health care. The Taliban has a contradiction, because, on the one hand, uh, many in the leadership, a number, don't want girls and women educated, but they only allow women doctors and nurses to deal with women in maternity hospitals. Talk about this. Yeah, so that's the, 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 the irony, in essence, because they only need women to deal with women, um, they need women doctors, which means you need women teachers. And so there will always be this core of educated Afghan women. Even in the 90s, the Taliban, the, you know, allowed doctors, female doctors, to continue working in, in some areas. So 
Today you have women working, you have a lot of women working in Afghanistan. I thought that was important to show. I went to this hospital which is being supported by the, the Red Cross, the ICRC, and I met these women doctors who are doing you know, heroic, life-saving work. They're, they're helping women who are coming in now from more distant rural areas because there's peace in Afghanistan at least. There's, there's, there's security on the roads. And so women are coming in in really rough condition from places that, where they would have just died at home. They're saving their lives. These women are working hard. But the fact of the matter is, is if you don't allow girls to go back to high school, then you're not going to have girls in university. You're not going to have girls in medical school. And eventually this pipeline of Afghanistan's nurses and doctors um, women doctors are going is going to run out, and so that's really I think the most compelling reason. It's not for international aid or Western approval that the Taliban should allow girls to go back to school. It's for their own country's interest. It's for the sake of their own daughters, and I think that there are some people in the Taliban who understand that uh, they've been blocked by the hardliners. But we can we can only hope that, um, especially with internal pressure from the many Afghans who are who are speaking up in favor of women's rights that they will see the light and allow the girls to go back to school. Finally, Matthew Aikens, um, 20 years, more than 20 years after the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, they left and left it, would you say, in worse shape than the U.S. when they invaded Afghanistan? And how do Afghans feel about this? Look, I, I think it's unfair to say that it's in worse shape than it was in 2001, when the country was ravaged, destroyed, impoverished. There have been a lot of gains over the last 20 years. Afghans have, you know, rebuilt their country themselves, but it came at such a high price in terms of bloodshed and suffering, the, the damage that the war did to the fabric of society, the, the refugees. So the fact of the matter is that today Afghanistan is again in crisis, but we don't have the same tools to deal with them. We're not occupying anymore militarily. Afghan girls are no longer the poster ch children for our war there. And there's a limit to what we can accomplish, but I don't think that means that our, our obligation to the country has disappeared. I think that we still need to keep the spotlight on Afghanistan. We still need to do all that we can to support Afghans outside the country and, and especially inside the country who are uh, still struggling, and, and that includes the girls who, who want to go to high school. And so we absolutely need to, to keep our relationship alive with this country. Matthew Aikens, contributing writer for The New York Times Magazine, author of The Naked Don't Fear the Water, an underground journey with Afghan refugees. We'll link to your new article, The Taliban's Dangerous Collision Course with the West. Coming up, a jury in California is convicted a former Twitter worker of spying for Saudi Arabia by providing the kingdom private information about Saudi dissidents. We'll speak with the sister of an imprisoned Saudi man who was tortured and jailed for running a satirical Twitter account. It was anonymous. Stay with us.